number representations. Some of this is just general background. I'm going to run through it fairly quickly. No, uh, as far as computers are concerned, we deal with binary numbers, right? And the idea is that we have two possible values, zero and one, right? And the reason we choose this is because as far as digital logic, for example, is concerned, it is very easy to represent two states, on, off, high, low, things like that, right? And uh, of course, as far as representing arbitrary integers, that is uh, numbers as is concerned, we use the place value system of numbers so that for example, a number like 0, 1, 0 essentially corresponds to 0 into 2 power 3, 1 into 2 power 2, 0 into 2 power 1, 1 into 2 power 0, which means 5 in decimal. Okay. Now, what do we do with negative numbers? The problem that, you know, why did we come up with binary in the first place? Because our hardware was only capable of representing two states, right? On, off, high, low. Okay. And if we need to introduce a new symbol to indicate a negative sign, which is what we do in regular uh, number, uh, decimal number representation, right? That becomes a problem, right? Because we don't have an extra sign that we can use. What it means is that we now need to resort to convention, right? We basically say that I tell you that this is what I mean when I am representing a number in a certain way, as long as both of us agree on the convention, there is no confusion about what kind of uh, number is actually being represented, right? Uh, there are many different ways by which, uh, many different conventions that can be done, right? One of them is signed magnitude, right? Which they, it's a sort of obvious thing to think of, where we, we would say that, let the first bit of the number indicate the sign. If it's zero, it's positive. If it's one, it's negative, right? But the other one, which is sort of typically more common, is what is called two's complement, right? And in two's complement, what we say is that the most significant bit, I will basically multiply it by a negative place value, okay? So it, it looks exactly the same as the numbers that we had earlier. It's just that the most significant bit alone, its place value is a negative value, right? So now if I take that, what I find is, if the most significant bit was a zero, that effectively means the resulting number is going to be positive and you know when I evaluate it I come up with five decimal as before right but now what if it was one one zero one now that one into two power uh, minus two power three essentially ensures that because you know two power three is guaranteed to be greater than whatever sum you can come up with after that it means that that one into minus two power three is going to ensure that the final result is negative in this case, 1 into minus 2 power 3 plus the rest of it gives us minus 3 as the value. Okay. So, remember, I mean, either way, you know, the representation of the number is still 0, 1, 0, 1 or 1, 1, 0, 1. It's just that the convention I follow now allows me to interpret it as a 2's complement number. Right? So, you need to keep that in mind. When I say 2's complement format, all that I mean is there is a representation of numbers, a binary representation of numbers. And if the number that you are trying to represent is negative, then you will use this format where the most significant bit is set as 1. Okay, and then figure out what the rest of the bit should be so that the magnitude turns out to be correct. Right? So, this is a common sort of confusion that I found among a lot of people. If I say, for example, you know, represent plus 5 decimal in 2's complement format, people usually take 0, 1, 0, 1 and then take the 2's complement of that. That's not what we are asking for. 2's complement format means that plus 5 will start with a 0, whereas minus 5 will start with a 1, and the rest of the symbol will be set according. Okay. Now, the interesting, another interesting aspect as far as this uh, format is concerned is that subtraction in this case is essentially identical to the problem of addition. Right? You can just use exactly the same hardware in order to take care of addition as you would do for, uh, subtraction as you would do for addition you just have to take a two's complement in between now that's as far as integers are concerned one of the interesting aspects that we want to understand over here is something called the dynamic range right and by dynamic range what i mean is what is the largest possible number that i can represent versus the smallest possible number and i mean magnitude right when I say smallest, I don't mean like minus infinity. I mean literally close to zero, right? Smallest in magnitude. 
and the ratio of the largest to smallest magnitude number is, is what is called the dynamic range of a set of numbers right so for example if we you know some of these examples are easier to explain in decimal so i'll just go with that for now if i restrict myself to four decimal digits what i have is the largest possible value that i can represent is 9999 right remember this is decimal and the smallest is 0001 okay one in other words which means that the dynamic range is 9999 divided by 1 equal to 9999 right and uh, usually this dynamic range is expressed in db decibels right the reason being that essentially this sort of indicates the maximum amplitude versus the minimum amplitude that can be represented using these numbers right and uh, since you are talking about amplitude we take 20 log to base 10 right so this should be log to base 10 And 20 log to base 10 of the number of decimal digits over here, in this case effectively, or rather 20 log to base 10 of the dynamic range, that is 9999, is pretty much equal to 20 into the number of digits, right? Which works out in this case to be 80 dB. Now, we could, we could compute this dynamic range in exactly the same way for binary as well. Uh, in binary, what I would say is that uh, let's say I have 5 bit numbers, right? 5 bit positive numbers, then the largest value that I can have is 1111. Remember, I said positive, this is not two strong. Right? Only positive numbers are allowed, which means that this is 31. Smallest is going to be 1, right? The dynamic range will be equal to 31 divided by 1, equal to 31. And the in decibel that would uh, essentially be 20 log to base 10 of 31, right? You can compute whatever that is, right? So effectively what we have over here is that if you do the computation, you will find that for every additional bit that you have, you are sort of doubling the range of numbers that can be represented, which basically means doubling the dynamic range, right? So every bit, in other words, contributes 20 log 2 to the dynamic range, which is basically 6 decimals, right? Because log 2 is 0 0.30 or something. So 20 times that is 6 dB. As an example, you know, for audio, typically we say that we need something like 16 bits of dynamic range, right? Uh, for high quality audio uh, signals. And that essentially corresponds to a dynamic range of 96 dB. Now, so far so good, we have been talking only about integers. What happens when you move to real valued numbers, right? Again, we have convention, right? In decimal, we had the luxury of using a new symbol, the point, right? the decimal point. Now, we don't have that symbol. So we need to once again resort to convention. And what we do is we do something called scaling. We essentially say that I'm going to scale the number by a certain value, right? So in decimal, for example, I could say that if I had five digits, right, the smallest increment that I can have is one. That would correspond to a change in the LSB over here, right? But if I assume that my point is over here, that is, you know, two places to the left, then the smallest increment would correspond to 0 0.01. If I had x point xx this way, then the smallest increment would correspond to 0. 3 zeros and 1, right? But the important thing is, in all the cases, the dynamic range is exactly the same. So in other words, the location of that decimal point did not change the dynamic range, right? In all three of those cases, the largest value divided by the smallest value remains the same, okay? Now, how would you do addition, right? If I had this, convention saying that, you know, at some point I basically have a, a decimal or binary point, then what I would say is that, you know, uh, so for example, 0101, 0.01, this is 5.25, right? But what does it actually corresponds to? It corresponds to some 6-bit value, which actually has the value uh, 25, right? So it's basically 16 plus 8 plus 1 equal to 25 divided by 
4. Right? And what this has, this value is basically equal to 17 divided by 2 power 4. Right? That is 17 divided by 16, which is equal to this 1.0625. Okay? So, in other words, you can see what I am saying. This number that I have over here, this 16 or this 4, this is essentially my scaling factor. Right? And as long as I can somehow convey that scaling factor and say that this is how much you need to shift the position of the point, that's all that I really need in order to convey the value of the number. Now, if I want to add such numbers together, what I do is I have to align the binary points. Right? And if necessary, I might have to truncate the output because, you know, over here, as you can see, I end up having 8 bits. Right? Whereas over here, I had 6 bits and this also had only 6 bits. So, if I want to convert back to 8 bits, I would probably need to cut the LSBs. Okay? Now, similar to what happens in the case of integer addition, you could also end up with problems such as overflow and so on. The way you handle them is also pretty much the same as you would do for integers. What about a slightly more complicated problem? Uh, multiplication, right? Here, and in fact, this is related to the sequential multiplier problem that uh, is there at the assignment, right? How do you do multiplication? I would pretty much take the LSB value over here, multiply the multiplicand, right? And effectively say, okay, what if I take this value 0101.01 01 01, and multiply it by 0 0.0001, right? What I have done is, I have taken this value and written it down over here, right? But after shifting it, shifting this by the point by four places, so that it comes here. Okay? That's essentially what you see over here. Now, this next, the second position, this corresponds to the next partial product, right? So, each of these is essentially a partial product. Right? It is the product of the multiplicand by one of the bits of the multiplier. Right? I put all the partial products down, add everything together and come up with the final product. Okay? So, this is essentially how I would do multiplication. Once again, almost identical to how you would do it in the case of integers. You just need to take care of what your scaling factors are. Now, what happens in the case of scaling factors? Like I said, 5.25 was this 010101, which is uh, actually 21, sorry, not 25, 21 into 2 power minus 2. Okay, so it has a 6 bit mantissa, sometimes also called the significant or the mantissa. Right? And this is multiplied by the scale factor of 2 power minus 2. What about the other value 1.0625? This has the value 01001 that is 17 with a scale factor of 2 power minus 4. Okay. Multiply the two together, what do you get? It's this long number 5 point which is actually translated as 5.578125, right? which is basically 21 into 17. You multiply the 6-bit and 6-bit mantisas and get a 12-bit mantisa as the result. Right? And the scale factor is 2 power minus 2 into 2 power minus 4 becomes 2 power minus 6. Okay? So, you can see where I am going with this. Effectively, all that I am saying is because you cannot actually use a symbol to indicate the binary point location, you need a convention which basically tells you, you know, there is some 2 power minus 2 or 2 power minus 4, some kind of value like that. And you need to keep track of it as you work with the numbers. 